Okay, let's start. So, uh, uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. Uh, the speaker of today is uh, Philip Schlatter, and uh, he is going to talk about high fidelity simulations of transition and turbulence. So, as usual, I uh, introduce the speaker very uh, quickly, and uh, then I leave him the the, the floor. Uh, so, uh, Philip Schlatter is a professor in uh, fluid mechanics at the Department of uh, Engineering Mechanics at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. Uh, he obtained his uh, PhD uh, in uh, fluid mechanics uh, from ETAHA in 2005. Uh, he then moved to the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, in uh, Stockholm and uh, became full professor in 2019. Uh, his work involves large-scale simulations of transition and turbulent flows, mainly in well-bounded uh, configurations. Uh, of particular interest are aspects of high-performance computing, spectral and spectral element methods, uh, data analysis and decomposition, optimization and novel uh, numerical algorithms, as well as interaction with uh, experimentalists. So uh, it's with uh, great pleasure that I uh, leave the floor to uh, Philip Schlatter. So Philip, I stop sharing my screen and uh, you can start sharing yours once again. There we go. We see your screen. Okay. Um, so do you see my screen and also my pointer, I guess? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, Francesco very much for uh, inviting me to give this seminar. Um, it's of course, uh, it's nice to give this seminar from, uh, for various reasons. So first of all, of course, it's always nice to give seminars and present uh, the work. But for me, it has always has also been kind of a special occasion because I had some, actually some health issues uh, previously during the last half year, and this is now uh, Kind of the first time when I'm sort of starting to get back to to real work, so I'm, I'm actually very excited to uh, to be able to present um, uh, the work today. Uh, the title for today is, of course, very generic: high fidelity simulations of transition and turbulence. And probably I tried to squeeze in too much um, material into this uh, these 40 minutes, um, but I guess we will see how far we get. Uh, I tried to give uh, an overview of different topics that we have been working on always with a focus on simulations and then trying to, to look at different aspects of both transition and, and the turbulence. Um, right. So, of course, uh, the, the work I'm presenting here is not uh, only done by me, there's a whole team behind it. And I guess in particular, um, there's also two collaborations that I would like to uh, point out. Uh, on the one hand, it's uh, with KIT in uh, Karlsruhe and the group of uh, Bettina Fronopfel, and then also uh, the group at Keio University in, in Japan by uh, Kochi Fukagata, who have contributed to some parts of this talk. So what I'm uh, going to talk about is roughly divided into these four main topics. So first, I would kind of like to motivate a little bit what we're really doing, what type of methods that, that we're using, and why we're using uh, these methods. And then I would first like to start to look at transitional flows, and this I will do at the example of, um, of pipe flow, and in particular bent pipe flow, which I found kind of an interesting, um, an interesting flow case. Uh, then we will look at some wall-bounded turbulence. I write here turbulence on wings, but wings is actually not the, the main focus today. It's more on control and on uh, wall shear stress uh, determination. And then at the end, depending a little bit on, on how much time we have, there's also a few modern or fancy numerical methods that I would like to present to you and maybe uh, make some of you interested in looking at those a little bit in more detail. But let's start now with kind of the motivation and numerical methods. I mean, this is a fluid uh, community, so I guess I don't need to motivate why we all think that turbulence is interesting and, and relevant to study. Uh, I typically use this, this slide here, which is, in my view, particularly interesting because it it kind of shows you that um, our mobility really has increased over, over the last uh, 200 uh, years dramatically, and it's, it's continuing to grow exponentially. And of course, that means that all these vehicles that we use for transportations are, of course, relevant, and they all are based in one way or another on, on fluid, me fluid mechanics. At the same time, I could also motivate uh, turbulence either from let's say, uh, geophysical flows, weather prediction, climate, and so on, 
but of course also from more bio-inspired flows, um, uh, hemodynamics and, and, and so on. I guess in all of these areas, uh, fluid mechanics is, is, uh, is relevant. Um, of course, there is a uh, big agencies that, that look at the CFD and the fluid mechanics in general. Um, this slide here, you don't need to look at all the text here, but um, I, I took it from a, a recent paper by NASA, who kind of analyzed the, the future needs of, of CFD and came up with a roadmap for the last, for the next, um, uh, well, 15, 20 years. They kind of identified a few aspects that we as a, as a community, CFD community, uh, have to work on in order to make um, uh, better predictions in, in the future. And I guess, we are somewhere here in the middle now with 2022. And of course, there's a number of aspects that I'm going to talk about uh, today that are to some extent also part of this, um, of this roadmap. So for instance, there is of course a, a focus on uncertainty quantification. We talk about adaptive meshes, AMR for adaptive mesh refinement. We have error indicators for our simulations. Uh, we, we talk about different computer architectures like um, uh, uh, GPUs, or also some you know, more modeling aspects like uh, LES or, or wall models, uh, LES and so on. Um, so I guess my talk has to be kind of put in the, in the perspective of also this roadmap, where there's actually one more, the in-situ analysis, where, where we try to kind of cover aspects of um, what is kind of thought to be important in, in CFD. So that brings me now uh, to, to my first real topic, and that is why are we using those computational methods that we're actually using? And in our case, we have done most of our research with the help of uh, spectral element methods. I just like to motivate very, very briefly what spectral elements actually are and why we believe they're useful. Um, so if you think kind of the more traditional methods would be a finite element method, a low order finite element method where you can um, discretize very complex domains um, with quite some uh, geometrical and, and also kind of physical detail. At the other, on the other hand, you have uh, fully spectral methods where you have high accuracy, but you're limited to, to very simple geometries, blocks uh, in, in principle. But of course, if you're interested in channels or boundary layers, that's maybe the methods of uh, choice uh, for you. The spectral element method tries to be kind of an intermediate between um, these two methods allowing a certain amount of moderate geometrical flexibility, but at the same time still giving this very fast spectral convergence within each of these, um, of these elements. And you then take these elements, you build up your mesh, kind of playing Lego with these, um, with these elements, trying to, to, uh, to uh, yeah, mesh your, your moderately complex uh, geometry. Now, when I said that we like this, this, this um, spectral convergence or the high convergence rate, I guess this is motivated on, on this also very standard uh, slide, but I think it's still very illustrative. So this is the, what is called the convective cone problem. So the idea is that you have an exact solution which corresponds to this cone just rotating um, indefinitely. And then you discretize it here in, in three different ways. Um, where you vary uh, the order of the approximation. So you go from order one to three to eight, but the total number of degrees of freedom is actually the same. And what you can see is that the higher the order is, the better are the, the, the diffusion and the dispersion properties of the, of the solution. So you, you keep this, this cone rotating for, for a longer time. That kind of motivates us to actually use methods of, of higher order. Now, uh, high order is just one thing. You also need to have a, a, a code that can that can be run. Uh, we have chosen to use the code Mac 5000, which I can, I'm sure that many of you are um, familiar with. It's um, an open source uh, spectral element code originally de developed by Paul Fisher at, at Argonne and now at um, at, uh, uh, at the University of Urbana in in, uh, in Champaign or the University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign. And um, this is a very nice code for uh, you know, basic fluid mechanics um, research. We, we also have contributed to some extent to the development of, of, of the code via um, a number of EU projects, Exaflow, Accelerate, and also Admire, 
and we, we added certain certain features to the code. Some of them we will also talk about um, later. One of the main aspects of NEC 5000 is the extreme scalability when it comes to parallel computers. And um, here I'm just showing you from a scaling test um, four years ago or three years ago, where you can see here the time um, that it takes per time step as a function of uh, the number of processors. And essentially you can see it goes linearly down. So it has perfect scaling up to a certain point. And this certain point then is something that we would call the strong scaling limit. That's when essentially the work per processor is not large enough anymore. And it just means that you would need to make your problem bigger if you want to run on more processors. But um, this strong scaling limit is actually at a very low, um, a low um, element count per core. So makes it, it makes the code really an inefficient uh, choice. I also have here uh, another uh, motivation why we, why we like uh, to do uh, spectral element uh, calculations and maybe not some other more low order methods. Uh, so we actually asked ourselves uh, some years ago on can we quantify my claim about you know, having higher accuracy uh, in our methods? Can we quantify it in, in any way? And um, what we did is we, we actually performed a, um, a sensitivity analysis um, of the accuracy of uh, NEC 5000 comparing it to, to open foam as an example of a more general purpose, low order code. So it's not that it's open foam specific, but it's just kind of a, a comparison between high and, and low order methods. And we, we kind of looked at this as a, as a UQ uh, problem, where the idea is that we have a, a referent, that we have reference data, and we just compare the predictions by MEG 5000 and open foam for in a channel flow for, for instance, the, 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 uh, the U tau, we have the mean velocity profile and also the turbulent kinetic energy. And what you then can plot are these uh, so-called uh, error, error maps, which were, I guess, first looked at by, uh, by Jan Myers and uh, Pierre Sago in some years ago. And you can, of course, see that the more you go into the lower left corner, which would correspond to the the region where you have highest resolution, um, you of course get closer and closer to the reference data. Um, but it actually turns out that this convergence towards the exact or the reference solution is not kind of uniform. And it actually also depends on what quantity uh, you look at. And I guess one main conclusion from just plots like this is that you can see that for a given resolution, um, the NEC 5000 result is actually more accurate than the one that you get from open form. Which is probably also expected. I mean, just given also the, the, the higher order and the higher cost. But perhaps more interesting, um, based on these error maps, we can actually come up with something that we can call the robustness of, of a specific code. And that would mean that you can actually look at the variance of your prediction when you average over a certain part of your, of your error map. So in this case, for instance, we, we have performed a, um, or so we looked at at the poly polynomial chaos expansion for a specific region of resolutions that you could expect in a real simulation. And then we could actually uh, plot error bars that we get for our um, simulations. And here on the left, you have the NEC 5000 results and on the right, you have the, the open foam result. And you can actually see that the higher order for the given resolution gives you actually much tighter error bounds indicating that the robustness of your code is actually much uh, much higher if you allow the, the resolution to vary within a certain range. And this kind of is, motivates us also to focus on, on these uh, methods of higher, um, higher fidelity. Um, you can then, in the UQ framework, you can do uh, then much more. You can also do something that's called a global sensitivity analysis, where you can also analyze why or what are the quantities that are actually determining uh, the, the lower or higher accuracy in, in certain parts of the domain. I don't want to go into the details here, but um, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting way of using UQ techniques to, to analyze the, the, the resolution requirements that you actually have for um, simulations. Okay, so now having motivated the, the, the use of, of our methods, I would like to start with the first uh, physical problem to look at. And um, the first part is actually about transition and uh, well, stability and transition in 
toroidal um, flows. The reason why I would like to show you that is um, that this is a, a flow case that I found particularly interesting because there is, it turned out that it was so little in the literature when we started with, with uh, looking at this flow case. And it actually turns out that it's a quite relevant flow case also for uh, practical applications. So this is um, essentially the flow case that we would like to look at. We have a torus, a donut, and we, we drive the flow with the pressure gradient. And we would like to, to kind of understand what the, the flow properties are in, in, in such a flow. Of course, the relevance uh, could be given by you know, heat exchangers um, that you can see here for high curvatures. For low curvatures, uh, you can think of pipelines which have a bend. Um, all of these, these cases are pipes with a certain um, curvature. Physically speaking, what happens is that because of this curvature, you will induce a secondary flow, so-called Dean vortices, which then essentially enhance the cross-sectional mixing in this, um, in this pipe. And this is what we're going to simulate now using, um, using numerical methods. The first question that we had when we started with this project, now I'm going back maybe five years ago, the first question was, okay, what are, what are really the stability properties? We know a straight pipe is stable, linearly speaking. This has been shown in a, in a number of publications that, that uh, you, you don't find uh, uh, unstable modes for a zero, zero curvature pipe. But the question then was, what happens if we start to increase the curvature from zero, which is a straight pipe, up to you know, higher and higher values of the curvature, up to the value of a curvature of one, which corresponds to a donor without a um, hole in the middle. So the question, the first question was, what is the critical Reynolds number in, in these cases? And when we started that, actually nobody knew what, what this would look like. Um, yeah, so we have flow rate versus curvature essentially to look at. And well, we, tr we tried out a few different um, algorithms on how to, how to do this uh, stability. We settled in the end to do a, a proper bifurcation tracking to really being able to, to follow this neutral curve. And what we got after many, many calculations is a diagram like this, where you can see that, yes, there is indeed a, um, a, a, neutral, a neutral point uh, for each curvature, different, from, uh, different than zero. And there's a number of different families that you, that you get, which are then the, um, the, the, the unstable or the neutral modes. So for instance, if we start here, this would be a, um, a mode that looks like this. And then kind of the, the more you go down in curvature, so of course the, 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 the bigger this, this torus or this donut becomes, you get different types of, um, of instability modes, um, like this. But actually, uh, this is not really what I would like to show you here for the higher curvatures. I'm actually, I would like to um, look a little bit more detail at this region here, which corresponds to the lower curvatures. So now you should really think of more a pipeline than a donut um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of curvature. So you know, again, look at something like this. Um, so this is what we would like to look at. So if you zoom out uh, a little bit, so now you see that the delta region is from zero to 0.15. And of course, we can compare with some of the experimental data that were available. So from, for instance, for Sreni Vasan, then there is some, some measurements. Um, there is the, the excellent experiments by, by, by Kühnen from, uh, from Austria. Um, there's a lot of different, uh, different measurements that we, could, um, that we could superimpose. And actually, our results are, are quite reasonable for a higher delta region. But there is this discrepancy here for the lower deltas. And we will talk about that in a in a second. So first of all, uh, let's just look at the number of interesting regimes that we actually have here. So this is one regime that we can look at, which is, I would say, where we have good agreement with, with the experiments. And uh, it turns out that this is where we have super critical transition. So we have one Hopf bifurcation that happens. And we can even analyze this Hopf bifurcation by looking at the, at the saturation amplitude. And everything kind of follows exactly in the way that it should should be. And I guess the reason why everything agrees here is also because this is really one unstable mode that one can directly pinpoint and, um, and analyze. This other region here um, is also an interesting, uh, interesting region in this delta Reynolds number uh, diagram. And that actually corresponds to a subcritical transition as 
pointed out by, by Kuhnen in 2015, um, where you have also quite a lot of very interesting uh, things happening. Um, in particular, you can also see that this subcritical transition line intersects the, the line with zero curvature at around uh, 2000, which of course is the, the value that you get for, um, for straight patterns. Uh, so we also analyzed this a little bit with, um, uh, with, no, with numerical simulations, where you can then look at you know, different fronts traveling and growing, having um, uh, turbulent spots or slugs and puffs and, and so on in, in, in this, uh, this flow case. The third interesting regime that you get here is actually the one where you approach zero curvature. Also there, maybe the, the, the question is, yeah, if you have a bent pipe and you approach zero curvature, so you make delta smaller and smaller, now, how is this the, 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 the stable situation of a, of a straight pipe actually approached? Is it so that the, the growth rate just, um, I mean, the, the critical Reynolds number just um, uh, diverges towards infinity? Or is it so that there is maybe a, a lower limit in, in uh, delta where you have a critical Reynolds number? We don't really know, and that's something that we're looking at uh, right now with, um, with a graduate student in, um, in Stockholm. But the, 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 the very interesting regime that I would like to, to spend a little bit time on is actually this intersection here, where you have the intersection between the subcritical and the supercritical um, region. And for that, uh, our previous picture has been, okay, we have supercritical, we have supercritical, and then we have something in the middle. And we would like to know how, how these two regimes actually uh, connect uh, with each other. And for that, I would just like to, to show you two simulations to kind of illustrate um, uh, what's happening here. Now let's see whether this works, yes. So this is a first simulation that we started with a relatively low disturbance amplitude exactly at this critical point, so at the intersection of the super and, and subcritical lines. And what you can see if you run this simulation for long enough, you can actually see that you revert back to um, the unstable mode. So you actually revert back to the supercritical um, situation. So you get a, a very nice um, regular pattern of, of the instability. If on the other hand, oops, no, that didn't work. Oh, now it should work. Yeah. If on the other hand, you start with a little bit of higher amplitudes, you actually see that, well, you see that in this, in this uh, diagram, you see that turbulence is growing, turbulence is getting, you know, it's, it's expanding more and more. And in the end, you will never revert back to a um, uh, to an instability mode. Now, of course, you can you can kind of say, well, this is perhaps expected. Uh, but the interesting thing now is we're having here this critical point where you actually see that in the same point in phase space, so to the same uh, Reynolds with the same curvature, you actually have the possibility to have both super and subcritical transition at the same time. So actually your phase space allows two different types of instabilities or instability types um, uh, to happen. And, and we found that this was a, a very interesting, um, uh, interesting discovery that you, that you can actually have super and subcritical uh, transition at the, at the same time, depending on, on the amplitude. Now, of course, you can also wonder what is the relevance of these, uh, of these uh, toroidal flows? Are they just, uh, Kind of um, you know theoretical concepts, but they don't really have a practical use. Well, actually, it turns out that flows or pipes with bends are are quite quite common in any type of uh, uh, process engineering. Of course, you have these type of things, and they have been studied experimentally and also with uh, some simulations quite a lot. And one thing that happens is that, um, as you as it's illustrated here you can actually see that downstream of such a bend, you get some, some type of oscillating motion, something that has in the literature been called swirl switching. And this has been a, a type of motion which has been um, observed mainly as structural vibrations in, in these type of uh, flow systems. So there, there is some, some inherent um, relevance to that. And now, of course, if you, there have been a lot of um, explanations in the literature why this is, why this is the case. Actually, we also did some simulations on that with a fully turbulent flow um, in, in such a bend. And what we then saw via, a, um, um, in this case, a POD analysis, so a, a modal decomposition, 
you could actually identify that you get some low frequency POD modes, which essentially resemble the instability modes that we have seen from our uh, stability calculations. So it seems to us that, that actually this swirl switching has perhaps nothing or not so much to do with the, the actual turbulence, but is actually just an instability phenomenon that is maybe driven by, by the turbulence, but it's inherent to this uh, flows with um, curvature. So which, and I guess looking at this gives directly a, um, a relevance to studying these more canonical flows with um, with waves. Okay, so having now talked about transition and and, uh, and stability, I would like to move on to turbulence. And um, as maybe some of you know, I've been um, very interested in, in doing simulations of, of wings. Um, in particular, we have this this um, NACA 4412 wing that we have looked at in, 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 uh, in various ways, um, which is kind of a, a wing profile that has been in use and has nice properties to, to study. But actually uh, today I would like to not focus so much on the actual, um, on the actual wing, which of course you know, we, can, we can look at in, in this way. Um, I would actually like to just show you uh, two results related to the control of turbulence that you could have in in such uh, uh, geometries. Um, so if we just very briefly uh, summarize uh, kind of control strategies, and I guess you have this, this kind of um, uh, hierarchy of different methods, the active and passive control methods, predetermined and feedback control. What we're going to look at today is kind of the simplest you can do. Uh, it's an active control scheme, which is predetermined. And we're just looking at um, uniform blowing and suction applied on a wing. And we would like to study that with, um, uh, with the goal of being able to improve the aerodynamic efficiency of such a, um, such a wing uh, geometry. And of course, aerodynamic efficiency or efficiency for, for an airplane, for instance, means that we would like to increase the lift and decrease the drag. So that's the kind of the combined um, idea. Of course, we're not the, the first ones or the only ones to, to, to look at that. There have been a lot of uh, experimental studies um, and also other simulations, in particular the ones by the group of, um, of uh, Wolfgang Schroeder in, in Aachen, which I would like to uh, point out here. Um, so, so we're kind of looking at a flow case, which is, uh, I guess, fairly relevant for also practical um, applications. So what did we do? So we have our, our wing simulation in our spectral element uh, context. And what we're doing is we have uniform blowing on the top, on the suction side, we have um, suction on the suction side, and we have also some body force damping, which is maybe not so relevant for today. But then we also have pressure, um, uh, we have a blowing on the, on the pressure side as, a, as another way of looking. And now the question is, how do these control schemes on a, on a kind of a basic level, how do these affect the efficiency of, of a wing? Efficiency is typically measured as lift over drag. So this coefficient, um, which tells you essentially how long a wing will fly for, or how far a wing will fly for a certain, um, a certain amount of loss of, of height. And um, I guess um, we can just very briefly go through a table like this, where we have uh, different cases. So we have blowing on the suction side, suction on the suction side, uh, and we have blowing on the, on the pressure side. And we look at, friction, the pressure, uh, the pressure drag, uh, and then we have lift and, and the drag coefficient. So we have a reference case where we have a wing profile, which gives you a, a lift over drag of 44, which is kind of a, a good wing. If you start to blow on the top, which is a usual method, which will reduce the, the drag, uh, the, the friction, which we see here with the green number. The problem is as soon as you apply blowing on the top, you actually increase the boundary layers and that gives you then an increased um, form drag, which actually turns out to be in such a way that actually your aerodynamic efficiency is destroyed. Which means that just looking at, at drag at friction reduction will not give you a better wing. Uh, on the other hand, if you kind of do the opposite, if you start to suck on top, which increases the friction by roughly 10%, you'll still be able by having lower pressure drag um, you're able to actually increase your aerodynamic performance by well, 5% or so. 
So, I mean, in the end, maybe these numbers are not so surprising uh, if you start to think of it, but I guess it really means that you need to consider these cases as more, more from a systems perspective. You really need to look at the whole system what, and, and, and think about what is it really that you would like to, to optimize rather than just go for, for instance, for frictional drag or, or pressure drag. It's the, it's the whole thing um, that matters. But perhaps, uh, I mean, a, another interesting thing in this context is actually to look at um, what can you obtain with also simpler simulation methods in these, uh, in these situations. Um, so we actually did also study when we used RANs, so simple RANs in open foam with, um, um, with blowing and suction. And also there we, 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 we had different amplitudes. And if you just compare our LES data or the, 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 the resolved data with the RANs data, you can see that there's maybe a kind of a systematic error of around 4%. But apart from that, you can actually cover quite well the trends that, that you had for, um, for suction and blowing um, for these uh, control methods. And of course, that then allowed us also to increase the Reynolds number range quite considerably. So we can now go to Reynolds numbers that were, or that, that are unattainable with resolved simulations and also Reynolds numbers that actually become relevant uh, from a practical uh, point of view, where we could also identify that essentially the same behavior as for the lower Reynolds numbers could be recovered for, for the higher Reynolds numbers. So for instance, now based on this, um, um, on this RAND study, we can identify that in principle, this, the blowing on the pressure side is probably the method that is, uh, is the one that is most, uh, most robust also when you start to, to increase um, the Reynolds number. Okay. Um, now we talked we talked a lot about uh, you know frictional drag and so on. Of course, that comes also the question: Yeah, how would you now, if you have an experiment, let's say, how would you actually measure that? How would you how would you know how the friction is on an on an airplane? And uh, that of course shows us that there is a certain interest in in the wall shear stress and perhaps also on the fluctuating wall shear stress. So in particular, when it comes to uh, let's say prediction of separation or characterization of separation, it's not enough to just know the mean uh, wall shear stress, but you may also want to know the fluctuating um, wall shear stress. So I would like to spend now the next five, ten minutes on, on talking a little bit on uh, how you could actually um, determine uh, the wall shear stress with, uh, with experiments. Um, the background to this is essentially shown on, on, on these two figures. So if you now go a little bit back to turbulence uh, theory or wall turbulence in general. Um, so I guess you can see here the, the, the well-known uh, mean velocity profile for near wall turbulence. Um, and here you have the, 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 the RMS, uh, RMS profiles where you have the inner peak here at the you know, Y plus being 15 or so. Now from theory, you in the very near wall region, of course you have the linear relation for the mean velocity profile and for the, the RMS values, you also have a linear profile with a certain um, proportionality uh, constant. And it turns out that this proportionality constant, so the C here, is actually the fluctuating wall shear stress. So this you can get from a, from a simple Taylor expansion. So that means that, that there's a direct connection between the RMS values and this uh, fluctuating wall shear stress, showing that this is really an important quantity for us to know. Now I guess the question now is, Okay, so how does this wall shear stress vary as a function of Reynolds number? And actually it turns out that because the URMS peak is increasing as a function of Reynolds number, so is this slope that you have uh, close to the wall. Or it has to be, otherwise you wouldn't kind of increase the, the inner peak as a function of Reynolds number. Um, so, so therefore the, there have been a, a number of studies comparing that, in particular also, um, when you look at the spectra of the wall shear stress, which is shown here on the right, you can see that everything matches perfectly. You just see this kind of the, 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 the outer region, which corresponds to the largest fluctuations, that there's a clear Reynolds number dependence there, which then in the end uh, means that you can increase of, of your walls, of your tau wall RMS as a function of Reynolds number. So far, so good. Um, and 
what, what then happened was there was a paper that, that we found was very interesting um, by, by, by Gubian et al, uh, who looked at um, a new type of probe, a so-called cavity probe that you could use to, to measure the wall shear stress. And we found this very interesting because that could be something that we could actually implement in, in our experiments as well. So the idea is that you have a small cavity, you know, scaling in plus units, maybe three plus units deep, so it's very, very small, and you place a hot wire into that cavity, uh, which shields then the hot wire from you know, different kinds of uh, conduction effects, etc. And you would use that to measure the, the motion stress. The problem was that the, this study then predicted that you actually get a constant value of this tau wall RMS, which is kind of a little bit at odds with what, what all the other measurements and simulations um, were showing. So therefore, we then thought it could be actually good to, to study this in, in detail to actually see whether small cavities actually allow you to give, give accurate, to give you the possibility to make accurate measurements of this um, fluctuating wall shear stress. Uh, so the first step was um, we tried to correct this, uh, this reference data that was done in a, in a comment in, in two years ago where we tried to correct that with, um, uh, with uh, spatial resolution effects. It's maybe not the, the most accurate thing to do, but uh, at least we, we tried to, to correct it uh, in order to see whether one would actually recover again a Reynolds number trend um, for, for these cavity probes, which is what we would have expected. And I guess one can see that there is at least some slope, um, but you also see a quite large over prediction of the, the measured value inside this cavity. And this is essentially what we would like to study now, uh, because it was already pointed out 20 years ago that there is no real study that looks at uh, shallow uh, cavities. So we set up a number of simulations simulating such cavities. And again, these are very small. These are, uh, this one is now nine plus units deep, but there's also cavities that are just three plus units deep. But nevertheless, you actually see quite a large distortion of the mean flow due to the presence of these, uh, of these cavities. You can then go in and actually calculate the mean flow, the RMS on top of these, of these cavities. And in particular, you can recover what you would measure if you had placed a hot wire exactly in this point. So what type of wall shear stress fluctuations you would measure at, the, at this point. And actually it turns out that you see quite a large increase of this estimated um, Wall Street Wall shear stress fluctuation, essentially exactly in the way as, as it was kind of predicted in, in this plot. And I guess that, that also brings us kind of to, this, to, the, to the conclusion here for, 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 for this study. It actually turns out that, the, uh, that this 20% over prediction that we kind of assumed for this cavity probe corresponds to how the flow field actually looks like in the cavity. So it actually turns out, so this 20% corresponds exactly to this overestimation for a cavity with the same um, depth that you, that you have. And unfortunately, I guess the conclusion for us was that this actually means that measuring in an accurate way in an experiment, the fluctuating wall shear stress still poses an experimental challenge. And I guess using cavity probes is not, is not the, the right way to look at, unfortunately. Now with this, I would also like to come to the last bit. It's not much left um, for the talk. Um, I guess I have maybe 10 minutes, five minutes left. Um, that should, should be um, sufficient. I would just like to show you at the end three different methods, which are kind of fancy modern methods, which um, we can all apply also to, uh, to CFD simulations. And um, you, may, you may get some, some nice uh, or interesting results uh, from that. So it's three different things. It's an, uh, a way of performing optimization. It's a way of performing multi-fidelity simulations, and then also a little bit about adaptive meshes that you can use. So if you start with optimization, I guess that's, uh, that's at, the, at the end of the day, that's really what we would like to do in our, in our simulations or in, in engineering design, we would like to develop methods to make a certain process better. So we have some sort of optimum um, that we would like to, to seek design parameters that reduce a certain or minimize a certain um, 
objective function. Um, what we're looking at here is a very specific way of doing optimization, and that's Bayesian optimization, um, which is a way of finding uh, the global optimum and also including by the use of um, a Gaussian process uh, regression to also include the uncertainty that we actually have in the prediction of our optimum. Now, we don't have time to, to kind of look at all the mathematical details here. I just would like to kind of show you the, the basic principle behind this method. And then if you're interested, then of course we can talk more about it and, and, and uh, you can also use it for your own cases. So there's, a, there's a, uh, an example here that, that kind of illustrates this, um, this optimization method that, that we started to like. So let's assume we would like to find the minimum of this, um, uh, of this um, black dashed line. So we'd like to find the, um, the optimum of this, of this curve. But we only have a little bit of data. We have these two data points, the, the big yellow dots. So these are, these are our data points. And based on these data points, we now build a, um, a Gaussian process, essentially a surrogate that tries to approximate this, uh, this black dashed line. And that's the blue line here. Yes, that's what is, uh, what is written here. So that's the surrogate. Um, and now we would like to, the method to tell us where we would like to have a new data point in order to make the surrogate actually better. So to make a better prediction afterwards of the, of the maximum. Therefore, we have what is called uh, down here, this figure here, that's EI, which stands for expected improvement. And the idea with this uh, function or with this, this um, functional expected improvement is that, the, that the, the method now looks at this curve and determines where do I have the highest, the potentially highest value of my, of my surrogate and where do I have the largest uncertainty? So it's a combination of the, the, the surrogate's value and the, the um, uncertainty that you actually um, have. And for instance, in this case, you would now see that, aha, uh -huh, the highest expected improvement would actually be at this point here. So that means the next data point would then be put exactly here, reducing, of course, directly the, the uncertainty in this point, and then giving rise to a next point where the, the where you would have the highest potential of where the maximum would lie. So in this case, it would then go here. It would um, reduce the uncertainty here. Then the next expected improvement would lie here, and so on. And in this case, uh, in in this way, you kind of build up the the position of where you would actually evaluate your uh, your function in a Bayesian way. Bayesian in the sense that you actually base it on what you have done. Uh, previously. And then if you do that a few times, you would actually converge to the global maximum at the, at the very end. And it's global because you're actually building a surrogate. Now, this is a very nice way and it's completely gradient free, which means that you can actually use it for experiments as well. So you don't need to have a, simulate, a simulation uh, behind. Uh, and I just want to show you one example where we actually use this. Um, so we wanted to predict if you want to simulate or if you want to have an experiment of a pressure gradient turbulent boundary layer with a specific pressure gradient parameter on the top, um, you have the problem that you need to specify how the surface of a wind tunnel or the upper wall of a wind tunnel needs to look like to get a specific acceleration a parameter here. And this, of course, is a very nonlinear problem. I mean, you, you wouldn't essentially need to perform a simulation to know what, what you get. So at the very end, this is actually an optimization uh, problem. So we can formulate that. We have done that using uh, open foam as a, as a, with a RANS, just as, a, as an illustration. And then um, we have essentially asked our method to give us a, a constant beta over a certain range. And then the method gave us out without evaluating any gradients um, to give, uh, give this upper, um, upper shape. Um, where you can obviously see that uh, there is a perfect or nearly perfect agreement of this um, um, of the beta prime. And actually, this also works for more, much more complicated betas. So, for instance, if you want to imitate in a in a in a wind tunnel a more complex pressure gradient distribution, as as for instance here for a wing, you can do that. And we did that, and now we did uh, we used a, a lot more of these um, 
collocation point, but the, the optimization was able to predict that also in a, in a nice way. Multifidelity, I think I have to skip for today because uh, it seems that we don't have enough time. Um, so I would like to directly go to the, uh, the last topic, which was uh, about uh, the adaptive simulations, because that's just two videos that I would like to kind of show you and, how, and kind of motivate you how, how nice um, adaptive methods actually can be. So we have spent now the last few years on enhancing this NEC 5000 simulation code that I mentioned at the beginning. To, to give it the capabilities of, um, of being able to run um, simulations where the mesh is automatically adapted. And this is now just an illustration for a Karman vortex tree around a, a, a cylinder. You, you have seen how nicely this method identifies exactly where uh, you would need to have um, higher resolution. And then you can kind of track individual vortices. If this is what you want. Um, to, uh, to give them the highest possible accuracy with the lowest uh, possible uh, count of, um, of grid points or elements. So I mean, this we can then do also for, for more complex cases like for, for turbulence on a, on a wing, where you can really see that all the, the necessary regions are, uh, are refined, um, uh, are refined properly according to some guidelines that you, that you can give. And of course, in this way, in particular for external flows, you save a lot of, um, of grid points. But now this is the last slide. I would just like to also show you that, that we have extended this also to rotating uh, geometries. This is a rotating wing where, where you can see the, the, the tip vortices um, and then also the interaction between the various um, blades of this wing and the turbulent flow that is, um, that is essentially starting at, at these wing tips. And this is now a simulation that we have performed completely, um, uh, completely adaptive um, with uh, adaptive mesh refinement on the fly. So you can see here how, how the mesh is actually changing or, you know, as a function of, um, of, of space. So with this, I would like to come to my conclusions. I, I try to show you or motivate why, why we think that high order methods are actually relevant for in particular, these kind of more fundamental cases that we looked at, where we also studied you know, dynamical systems um, approaches to transition. So this, the, uh, the, the idea of, of having you know, subcritical and supercritical transitions intersecting in, in one point. We looked a little bit at the control of, um, of wings. We looked at the fluctuating wall shear stress. And then I tried to show you some of these more fancy methods. Unfortunately, I couldn't show you the multi-fidelity uh, part, but uh, Maybe, maybe uh, next time we can we can look. At so with this, I would like to to thank you, and uh, of course, uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. So thank you very much, Philip, for uh, for this uh, presentation, very comprehensive. And I would like, uh, as you said, just to invite uh, uh, the participants uh, to ask questions. If you have any, just feel free to unmute your mic or. Uh, you can write in the chat and I will report the question. Um, yeah, go ahead, Martin. Hi, Philip. How are you doing? Hi. Philip, I have a question to your last topic, uh, and that was essentially the adaptive mesh refinement. Mm -hmm. um, so, for that, I understand you need hanging nodes. Yeah. Is that something you introduced at was NAC 5000? Yes, exactly. That was the kind of the, well, as soon as you do adaptive mesh refinement, you need essentially two, two parts. You need a code that handles hanging nodes and you need a way of determining where to refine. So error indicators or error estimators. That's the two parts that you need. And then of course there's some technicalities about you know, uh, load balancing and, and, and so on. So, so is, that, the, is that, yeah, sorry. So, so our main contribution now to the NEC 5000 development was that we now coupled um, NEC 5000 with um, a, a library that, that, that uh, manages uh, that manages a hierarchy of, of, uh, of grid nodes. So we did that with a, so the, the, the PForest library, which essentially starts from a, a coarse conformal mesh and then keeps track of the, the refinements. Um, 
And it actually turns out that the modifications to NEC 5000 are not so large because most of the work in the spectral elements code are actually element local. And that is unchanged. That is not affected by the hanging node. So the only changes that you have is in the communication. So when you when you talk to your neighbors and exchange data, you you need to do interpolation because you have you know on one side you have a larger element and on the other side you have two smaller ones. So you need to do this inter and extrapolation. Um, and then you the second thing is when it comes to preconditioners for the pressure, you you also need to, to work with. Yeah, but this is something we did, and so we have now a version that is non conformal for NEC 5000, yes. Is that, uh, yeah, well, we have that for our discontinuous scalarking code, but we use the NEC 5000 for certain purposes. Um, is that publicly available, or is that just a version that only you sort of say develop? I mean, you know how it is. I mean, right now I mean, we're developing it, and we have now a few groups um, or a few, a few different cases that we're running. Um, if you have something that you would like to run, um, we're happy to, to, to do that. The problem is it's of course still kind of work in progress. So, I mean, there is, I see. You know, but if, if you're interested, absolutely. We can, we can look at that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I may ask one of my PhD students to contact you on that issue. I'm, I'm not sure if we really presently need it, but it seemed to be that we might need it. Anyway, thanks I mean, a lot. For, for external flows, it's excellent because then you can really focus your resolution of where you need it. And in the far field, you don't you don't have anything. Internal well, flows, it doesn't help so much. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we were we doing a jet flow, so that was the reason why I'm asking. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the. So I see that uh, there is uh, Marco Zauner who is uh, who would like to ask a question. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. For very talk. Uh, I really enjoy it. But it's a pity that you couldn't um, you couldn't detail the work on multi-fidelity simulations. So I would be still quite curious about your experience. And um, let me ask you a naive question. So uh, will you continue working in the future more on wall model LES? I think as you were mentioning. In the introduction, or, or yes. did you use wall model? Uh, so I mean, wall model is kind of a separate uh, part, uh, which I guess we are working on on right now, trying to identify also what the benefits of wall model LES coupled to a spectral code actually would be. So mm -hmm. what what are the benefits of having a high order discretization of the domain, and then kind of going to the well in a way to the low order representation of the wall using a, a wall model. And I guess mm -hmm. that's that's kind of a question that we're trying to, to look at in particular in the context of uh, atmospheric boundary layers where you know there's simply no other way than doing wall models. So it's not a it's not a question of whether maybe we could resolve it. It's just impossible. And but there for instance I would see that there could be quite some benefits in having the high order discretization you know in, in the the atmosphere in that sense, where, where you, you have all the couplings between temperature and velocity and so on, which need to be, of course, as accurate as possible, but you simply cannot get away without doing more models. Have you also tried a kind of hybrid runs LES methods? Well, not, not, with, not with, the, with the kind of the high fidelity codes, no. Okay, okay. Uh, but, but of course, I mean, in the end, the, the more complicated your role model, is the kind of the more hybrid it becomes in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true, that's true. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, publications and more results from your side on that. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Uh, then maybe I can uh, ask you a follow-up question to the one of, uh, uh, to, to the first questions we had. Um, so you, you are talking about uh, H adaptivity, and I suppose that uh, you would be interested also in uh, P adaptivity because I mean that's um, and that that I think it poses quite some different challenges because uh, you the order of interpolation you can get and the uh, control of uh, like um, 
uh, very fast uh, divergence phenomena due to a mismatch of the interpolation maybe can, can you comment on that so so we have we have not looked at p i mean we have not looked at local p adaptivity and the reason is actually quite simple um, and that was due to the difficulty of actually implementing it um, because all all the uh, allocations of ar arrays in, in NEC 5000 are actually done, you know, statically with um, uh, kind of fixed array sizes, which then of course give you uh, a limitation when you then suddenly would like to have P, P adaptivity. Um, so it was from an implementational point of view, it was easier for us to actually do age refinement because then the elements are the same. You just need to work on the kind of the glue between the, the elements. Um, so that was the kind of the more practical reasoning why we did H. Um, I agree with you. Ideally, you would like to have H and P. And then, of course, you know, identifying with maybe different area indicators what you want to do in what situation, uh, depending perhaps on, on the local properties of the flow. Um, so in that sense, I do not have any firsthand experience doing P refinement locally. So I, I cannot say what, what challenges it would actually pose. Technically, if you had a code with the dynamic allocations, I guess you could do it. You can also do the interpolation spectrally between, between the elements. So, I mean, that could be solved, but I would not know what issues it would actually pose when it comes to, as, as you said, kind of mismatches and, and, and so on. But for us, the age refinement was done because it was easier um, or more practical. Too. I see, I see. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, I, I just have uh, one um, more de more specific uh, point on that. I mean, in terms of, uh, um, uh, so do you expect that there is kind of a trade-off between between the uh, more sparse metric metrics produced by by the H adaptivity and the uh, faster convergence uh, done by the P adaptivity in that sense then. Or a, well, that, that's that's a good question. I, I I don't dare to actually say anything. Um, I I would now say that the problem what could also be a little bit with P adaptivity at some point. I mean, we're already now running all our codes on like order seven or so eight. So I mean, there's not so much you know yeah. P that you could actually do because at some point you also have the issue of the grid. I mean, the, you know, you need to have some sort of Gauss-Lobato uh, yeah, yeah. point distributions. I mean, it gets it gets a little bit um, too fine. You may get time step issues and and all of that. Uh, so somehow, I I feel that 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 perhaps that the way forward is actually the H coupled yeah, yeah. Uh, coupled maybe with something that's called R refinement, which is just moving the points <laughs> without yeah. changing anything. So yeah. So, but I wouldn't dare saying that you know one is better than the other. I, I simply do not have the any results to 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 support. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, I I see I see that there is uh, uh, another question. So um, just uh, uh, Taigun, just feel free to unmute your mic and uh, to ask your question or write in the chat as you prefer. Uh, hello. Hi. Thanks for the talk. It was uh, it was nice. And uh, my question is about uh, this adaptive mesh method. Um, very roughly, how much computational resource do you save by implementing this method compared to uh, a regular mesh? Let's say. Not that, <laughs> that is, of course, uh, that's the relevant question, and it's I think also impossible to answer um, yes, because uh, as a method, you don't know, maybe. I, I, I guess the main issue is you're actually solving different problems in the end. Um, because if you look if you look here, for instance, at this wing uh, simulation, now this is done with adaptive meshes. And of course, it's now done in a very big domain um, where, where you know, the domain has a size of you know, 20 quarts or whatever you know, away from the wing. The corresponding conformal simulation that we did earlier essentially ended maybe here. You know, uh, uh, along this golden golden color here, and um, 
because we couldn't we couldn't extend it more with a conformal mesh so we had to put the boundary condition typically taken from rands at that point to still get the right pressure distribution so therefore a direct comparison is very difficult to make because you would look at different cases in, in, in these situations um, one no, thing I can I can say is that it doesn't get slower uh, because the overhead that you have of doing the the non-conformal one is is actually very very small and it's mostly the local interpolation and everything that is local is for free in a, in a parallel environment and the communication is 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 the same so so I think at the very end you can you can only win uh, by doing that but for the wing now, uh, the the actual, I mean, what what we say the the saving is is uh, I mean, it's really a, it's an order of magnitude because you don't need the, the the points in the far field. In a turbulent pipe, we have also tried it. There we could down, get down to maybe one half or so of the grid points with, with the same the same um, quality of the results. So yeah, yeah, thanks. That's maybe as much as I can say. Yeah. Okay. So let me just quickly read the question still regarding uh, uh, adaptive mesh refinement, and then uh, we can give the uh, we can we can allow another participant to ask a question. So for the AMR, uh, there might be some jumps from the vertical structure between the interface for different refinement levels. I was wondering uh, whether you see. That, uh, whether you see that in your simulations and also AMR, do you use quad uh, uh, or a three uh, approach or patch approach? So the second one is easy. Uh, it's, um, well, in, it's, it's oak tree uh, refinement. So we, if, if we want to refine one element, we, we, we divide it in, in all directions. So one element becomes eight elements. Um, for the first part, yes, uh, of course, the, the, the method is oh, we still it. have. Uh, um, the method is still uh, C zero continuous, so it, it means that that in the end it's only the velocities that are actually continuous, and over a hanging node, it's not even that the, the grid points do not agree. So that means, of course, that if you are badly resolved, then of course you would get terrible terrible things in, in the vorticity or in, in, the, in the derivatives. Uh, however, if, if you're doing that in a DNS context and you make sure that, that the lower resolution that you have when, when you have a high and a low resolution meeting, that the lower resolution is still fully resolved, which of course you should in a DNS context, then you do not have, um, you do not have a problem. So, so I would say, it's inherent that you would get chumps in the in the derivatives if you're low, if you're badly resolved, and and of course then if you start to 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 plot vorticity contours, I mean of course you you, you get your you get your chumps, um, but the good thing is it's stable, so so you can use these lower resolutions to run an error estimator to to provide you then with the data where to refine um, later on. But on the highest refinement level, as for instance, the one that you kind of see on, the, on this picture, uh, you actually do not have any, any chumps um, anymore. We have looked at that in, in very great detail because we were also afraid of this happening. And we presented some results at the ECOSA home conference last year in, in Vienna, or not really in Vienna, but supposedly in Vienna. And um, we have written a proceedings article on that where we really look at the, at the quality of the interfaces um, looking both at uh, you know visualizations, but also at statistical quantities like budget terms um, and so on. So in, in the end, it all boils down. You need to be resolved on the coarser side um, in order to avoid wiggles or jumps. But that's anyway what you need to do. I hope that's okay. Okay, thanks. I think there is someone else who would like to, I, I, I think actually the previous participant uh, uh, was satisfied with your, with your answer. He writes in the chat and uh, Hung, I left you the, I leave you the, the, the mic, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks a lot for the presentation. 
I just want to get back to the, your work on the control of the wing. Uh, so when you uh, numerically, how did you impose the, the, the blowing and the suction on the wing surface? And then what is the order of magnitude of the, of the velocity that you use for blowing and, and oh, suction? Oh, this, did you this have that in mind? <laughs> yeah, maybe I didn't say that. It's, uh, it's, it's actually very low. It's, um, it's on the order of 0.1% of the oh, free stream oh. velocity. Okay. So, so yeah. And do you, yeah, that's low. And do you think that the, the conclusion that you, you, uh, you make about the lift and drag ratio that will change when you change the, 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 uh, the, the blowing and suction velocity? Do you try to change that? Uh, yes. To optimize? We, we, we tried, and uh, I think I, I have. Okay, uh, so I, I, it, it of course it gets better um, if you have higher higher amplitudes. The problem, of course, mm -hmm. is uh, you also need more. So, oops. So, for instance, let's look at it. Uh, well, we can look at it at it here. Um, so, the, these the the light blue and the darker or the orange and red they correspond to 0.1 and 0.2 percent. Okay. So. That the more you do, the more you extend in, 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 in these directions. Okay. But of course, at the at the cost of uh, you know needing to blow more or to suck more. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, in the end, it's I mean, there's something that we have not considered in 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 these in, in at least in the LES simulations, not in the in the RANs. There there is some way of doing that, but we have not considered about. What it costs, or what the the, the the effort is to to do the blowing and suction, because in the end you you need to view it as a as I said as kind of a systems thing. You need to mm. you need to see what you pay for for doing the control, and then you need to see what you gain um, from it. At least when it's about the cruise conditions, when landing and takeoff, of course, then you may want to just increase. I don't know, maybe the the. the or decrease the, the separation, for instance, but then it's a different mm -hmm. type of necessity that you have. So the library uses the most uh, velocity on the, on the wind surface? Or, or? Yeah, for, for, uh, for now we did that. So we did not consider the, you know, any actuator or, you know, holes or, you know, something like that. Yeah. It's just a Dirichlet condition which is um, non-homogeneous. And, uh, and the velocity is like, uh, is it both in a continuous place or in a discrete, like you have many holes and then- No, it's, it's continuous. It's, uh, it's, okay. it's continuous, yeah. And this, the position also, uh, what, what uh, helped you to determine? Uh, uh, um, well, we, we, did some, we did some tests. So we, we kind yes. of had, had this region here. We also had, some tests where we did started a little bit uh, later. It turned out that this is not so important for the general conclusions. Um, okay. I know there, I mean, there's in the literature and we have also done that earlier. You can of course now think of having patches of where you would apply your blowing and suction. Mm -hmm. There's a, for instance, an interesting paper from Imperial, I think two years ago when they used optimization to, mm -hmm. to, to distribute where to blow and where to suck. Um, you, you can, of course, all do that, um, but for the kind of the more general behavior, I think it wouldn't matter so much. Okay, please. Thank you, Lars. That's it for my side. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. Just uh, once again, feel free to unmute your mic, or uh, you can write it in the chat and I can report the question. May I ask a second question? Uh, please go ahead. Um, about the difference between your LES and RAN simulation, um, I found it quite interesting that the error didn't seem to be Reynolds number dependent. Um, could you comment on that, on the error, on the systematic? I don't, actually, I don't know whether it's Reynolds dependent because this is at one Reynolds number here. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Ah, <laughs> so, sorry, yeah. I... So, so this is at one Reynolds number. I think we actually, we have a comparison at, uh, at 200,000 as well. Uh, so okay. factor of two lower. But of course, then these, these results, these are just 
uh, rands because mm -hmm. obviously we cannot do an alias at four million. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. So, so that they, they, we we don't know. Uh, we we just know it at these lower Reynolds numbers. What the what the error is. So therefore, I'm not I'm not daring to say that it's always four percent. Okay, that's that's not kind of the the statement here is rather that at four hundred thousand it seems to be very similar. So that's let's hope for the best. And okay, I okay. guess that's that's my and um, the run simulation I guess was fully turbulent or. Yeah. I mean, fully turbulent. It's 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 cap. It's reproducing the case that that we had in the in the sim in the in the DNS or LES. So we had a tripping, you know, something like this. Okay. So we we implemented ah, so tripping on the tripping in the runs as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Okay, is there any uh, anyone else who would like to ask a question? Just once again, just feel free to unmute your mic or to write it in the chat. Well, this doesn't seem to be the case. May I may ask you a last question regarding, uh, I think it was the, Maybe the first the first uh, topic of fluid mechanics you dealt with that was like the instability in uh, um, um, pipes like uh, toroidal pipes and so on. Um, do you observe any sort of uh, uh, phenomenon related to kind of a bypass instability uh, when when you when you have the linear process and when you also have the finite amplitude process, do they kind of? Uh, uh... Well, that's that's of course a good question. I guess you would see that in the subcritical case. Uh, so for the um, for the lower curvatures, um, I mean bypass in the sense that you get the you know you get um, uh, uh, slugs and 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 so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. That would be in in this regime here, yeah. where you would essentially get a kind of bypass transition in, in the sense that you don't have any instability wave, and and then then in the end, I guess transition is really um, is determined by the, the the speeds and the interactions of the of the fronts that you get on the on the front and on the back of, of a slug or a, or a or a puff that that you have, and then they would grow and merge and and so on. So yes, uh, there, there is there is this this um, this this phenomenon as well as in the straight pipe, and and I guess that's also one one of the aspects why I really like this bent pipe because it has everything. Um, if you go to higher curvatures, you have uh, modal instability with a, a clear, you know, a, a clear Hopf bifurcation, which everything is now like like in theory you get all these orbits and your know, period doubling and and and, and all of, all these kind of things. Then, then you have the bypass case. Then you have maybe the, you know the divergence of the, the instability for for zero curvature. And then you have this fancy thing when when you have you know uh, kind of this the critical point where you have uh, two different instabilities at the same time. Which uh, I guess at the time it was one of the first times when one saw that. Now um, a colleague of ours has, uh, at KTH um, uh, has also seen that in, in boundary layer flows where you get the interaction of of TS waves and bypass transition at uh, you know very high Reynolds numbers. So so it seems to be actually that that you have the same super and subcritical stuff at the same point happening. This is is more general than than we actually thought in the beginning. Of course, that's uh, it's actually quite interesting. Yeah. So yeah therefore, actually, I like this band pipe. It's, yeah, it's very yeah. rich. Yeah. Actually, I was I was in fact thinking. Uh, I arrived to the questions by thinking to to termination uh, waves yeah. and bypass yeah. transition. Uh, yeah. no, exactly. So you you have exactly the same at very high Reynolds numbers or very high I mean, higher Reynolds numbers in boundary layers, where you where you can have interaction of TS waves and kind of spots or, or streaks uh, transition. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thanks for. Uh, 
for uh, replying so so many questions as you could uh, uh, experience yourself. The the discussion was very active, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, for giving your talk and uh, uh, for uh, being so patient with questions. Um, thank you very much. Bye bye. So I wish you a good evening and uh, hope to see you all uh, for uh, next uh, webinar for the webinar of next week. Have a good evening. Bye.